All right. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Lin. I, uh, this is a joint work with Yue Qi Chen from Penn State, Yu Han Wu from Northwestern University, Dong Liang Mu from Hua Zhong University of Science and Technology, Chen Sheng Yu from George Washington University, Xin Yu Xin from Northwestern University, and Kan Li from Baidu USA. Part of this work was, was done at Baidu USA when I was an intern there. So Linux kernel is a piece of software that has become a part of our daily life. According to a recent statistic, 85% of smartphones run on Linux kernel. Around 39% of websites are powered by Linux kernel. Therefore, the security of Linux kernel is the security of our infrastructure. However, despite Linux kernel is security critical, it's buggy. So this is a number of bugs found by Sysboot, which is a continuous fuzzing platform that runs a kernel fuzzer. In the past four years, it reported around 5,000 bugs. Among those bugs, around 1,000 bugs are still unfixed. Since it's not really hard to find bugs in, in Linux kernel, it often get exploited by the hacker community. We successfully demonstrated a local privilege escalation on the last, latest version of Ubuntu system, at least years point to even. With so many bugs in Linux kernel, it's important to know their exploitability. First of all, knowing the exploitability could guide the design of kernel hardening. Based on the observation of kernel exploits, many kernel hardening are developed to eliminate, eliminate the exploit component. Second, knowing the exploitability of bugs promotes bug fix in upstream and the fix adoption in the downstream. We have seen many cases that a severe, a severe bug being public in the sysboot but not getting enough attention until being exploited. Besides, there are also many bugs being fixed in the upstream kernel but they're, they do notify the downstream vendors about the exploitability. As a result, those severe bugs are ignored and the downstream kernel stays unfixed, leaving the kernel vulnerable to attacks. Given those benefits, Google has acted to promote research on kernel exploitation. From KCTF program, Google pays up to $91,337 US dollars for exploits in, in the vulnerability in Linux kernel. To assess the exploitability of kernel bugs, a straightforward way is to write the exploit. However, this is really hard. First, kernel is complex. Analyzing kernel bugs requires expertise. Second, writing kernel exploits is time consuming. It often takes experts days to write the proof of, of concept. Therefore, given the large amount of bugs in kernel, it's not realistic to utilize manual effort. In practice, security researchers assess the exploitability of bugs by approximating the likelihood of exploitation based on the error behavior of the bugs. In general, most error behaviors like use of the free, out of bound access, double free are exploitable because they may demonstrate powerful memory corruption capabilities to override critical data. For error behaviors like non-pointer dereference, and general protection fault. They are less likely to be exploitable since their memory corruption capability is limited. For error behaviors like warning, bug, bug on, and info, these are logs from kernel developer which don't demonstrate memory corruption capability. So they are also considered as less likely to be exploitable. And this classific classification aligns with the CVSS score on the types of vulnerabilities. Memory corruption bugs like use of the free has high, have highest CVS score while error logs is the lowest. This practical approach has been used by most security researchers. However, sometimes it might underestimate the exploitability because it's possible that a severe memory corruption bug just doesn't show memory corruption capability. 
for example, you see a warning error behavior of a bug, it indeed is the use of the free. And it's possible that a severe memory corruption bug may only show limited memory corruption capability. For example, you will see a non-pointer dereference error from a bug, which is considered as less likely to be exploitable. But when you trigger the bug differently, it may show a, memory, a severe memory corruption. Here, I want to show a real-world example of a severe bug. The bug was firstly found by Sysproof and was reported as a warning error. Based on the approximation approach, the warning error is considered as less likely to be exploitable because it doesn't have any memory corruption capability. In the upstream, the bug still got fixed after a period of time. However, some downstream vendors didn't port the fix to their kernel, so it was unfixed in their kernel. And at the time, there was no CV assigned for the bug, no discussion, and no public exploit. Nobody was aware of the exploitability until we found its use of the free behavior with Gravy and developed a working exploit for it. We responsibly disclosed the exploit details to Red Hat, they acknowledged our findings, and finally patched their kernel. Red Hat also helped us notify other effect vendors, and the CVE was assigned for this bug to keep track of it. This case tells us that a kernel bug could have multiple error behaviors. As we can see from the CVE, the bug could have a warning error and a use of the free error. To illustrate this, assuming the red node is the side of root cause. When it's triggered through syscall A in the picture, the kernel crashes at the left node. But when the root cause is triggered from another syscall, the kernel crashes at a different place. With different inputs, the kernel may execute on different contacts and crash at different place, which shows different error behaviors. So given one error to find other error behaviors of the bug, we present Gravy, an object-driven kernel fuzzer. Our insight is that, first, the implementation of Linux kernel is object-oriented, following a strict hierarchy. In each layer, the data is stored in the object for that layer. As you can see in the picture, in the upper layer, the data is, is stored in OBJ A, while in the lower layer, the data is stored in OBJ B. Second, in order to trigger the root cause of a bug, operations on some kernel objects are necessary. For instance, assuming the red node is the side of root cause, the green node is the allocation side of the vulnerable object. To trigger the bug, the kernel has to allocate the vulnerable object first. Without allocating the vulnerable object to set up the context, the kernel may execute to other path, thus fail the trigger of the root cause. Third, Data in kernel propagate through kernel objects. Assuming that the yellow node is the side of the use side of vulnerable object, the data in a vulnerable object can be propagated to different yellow nodes within the scope. From a high level point of view, giving a, giving a error, bug error behavior, Gravy starts from the crashing side and then identify critical kernel objects to the bug with backward hand analysis. The object identified not only help us set, not only help the fuzzer set up the context needed to trigger the bug, but also bounded the fuzzing scope, which avoided the fuzzer to explore codes in a related context. To identify the critical objects to the kernel bug, we first identify the source of the tender analysis. In Linux kernel, bug manifests error behavior because some check conditions are not satisfied. Those checks come from either from the developer, compiler, or the memory manager unit. For example, in the left node, in the left side, it's a one-on check, making sure the work list is empty 
Otherwise, the condition is unsatisfied and the kernel complex. In the, in the right side, the compiler generates the checks before the memory read and write operation for the source code in line two. If the memory access is legal, the kernel also complex. To perform tent analysis, we use the variables in the checking condition as a tent source. Starting from the tent source, we will attempt to parent structure variables if its field is tended. For example, if the base field is tended, the variable timer will be tended as well. Eventually, the tent will be propagated to variable NAPI and PVAL. We also tend to loop counter if the loop iterator is tended. The intuition is that if there is an overflow in the loop, the loop counter might be the issue of causing this overflow. Look at the, the example function here. In line four, there is an overflow in the buff, buffer array. This possibly is because the loop counter is too large. The tent analysis is terminated when it reaches to the definition of tent variables. It also terminates when there is no call for the function, for example, syscall entry or interrupt handle. With the analysis discussed before, we will find out many objects. However, the analysis will include objects from the abstraction layer of the kernel, which is very popular. If the object used for the fuzzing is very popular, it might not be useful for to bound the fuzzing. Therefore, in this work, we first rank the popularity of objects, then we fill out popular objects. For more details of this part, please refer to our paper. With the object on hand, we then use, utilize a customized compiler to instrument the base block involved with the operation of critical objects. The instrumentation will send object feedback to the fuzzer when it's executed. So in addition to code coverage, we also have object coverage as a feedback to the fuzzer. Different from traditional fuzzers that maximize code coverage, Gravy maximizes the, the object coverage during the fuzzing. Only inputs reaching this site containing objects are interesting to the fuzzer, and the fuzzer will try to find more coverage, object coverage. To evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of Gravy, we, we use a 60 kernel box and the run our tool on, and syscall for comparison. After getting the result, we utilize manual effort to triage the bug. The result are twofold. The first part is the exploitability escalation. In this part, we aim to find whether bugs that originally behave as less likely to exploit could be turned into behaviors belonging, belonging to likely to be exploited. In the result, Gravy identified 26 bugs with exploitability escalation versus four by six color. The second part is to explore more exploit potential, given a likely to exploit bug. The use case of this will be like, you see a bug with use of the free read behavior, you would like to see if there is any other use of the free read capability of the bug, which provides stronger primitive for exploitation. In this part, Gravy identified eight bugs with this potential, while Syscaller only identified one of them. I want to highlight several takeaways here. First, a kernel bug could have multiple error behaviors. In our experiment, we found 34 bugs in our data set. Our tool could find at least one additional error behavior. Second, exposing multiple error behavior contributes to more precise exploitability estimation. Ex multiple error behavior represent different effects of bugs. Exposing other error behaviors help us understand the worst effect of the bug. Third, in a comparison to syscaller, we show that our approach to finding multiple error behavior is much more effective and efficient. We have open source our tool, so feel free to try it out and feel free to contact me if you have any question. Thank you.
Questions? Um, hi, very interesting talk. Um, I'm Kyle Zhang from Arizona State University. Uh, I have a question about this work. Um, actually, it's a comparison between this work and a very recent work called SIDScope. So both works are trying to find the uh, different behaviors of, a, of the uh, initial uh, bu bug report. I think SIDScope uses another approach, which is, uh, I'm not going to go details about that, but one of the approaches basically saying that um, the syscaller, which is Greb is based on, will try to find the first, report, first bug report, for example, a warning. But this is actually not a good idea when you're trying to do behavior eval uh, exploration. Because, for example, after triggering the warning, it will trigger it, for example, you, you suffer for your right. Do you think this um, work is complementary to your work and maybe combining these two work can, can uh, give us a better uh, behavior exploration uh, tool? Yeah, I think so. So one difference, if I remember correctly, one difference between our work with and their work is they don't uh, vary, vary the inputs to the bug. They don't, they just use the input from the original report and they try to find the, the true effects of the input can trigger. So I think that's complementary okay. to this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Chris Anasio, Carnegie Mellon. Um, so y you talk about kind of tracing through the data structures, uh, the kernel objects. How do you, does that, does your tool automatically discover that or do you need to tell your tool about uh, some amount of the structure of the kernel objects before being able to trace those? Can you, can you explain uh, that a little bit? So we start from a kernel crash. When you crash, you see, a, you can see the, a crash point where the crash happens. So from that crash point, we extract some variables from that side. And we start from that side and do a backward kind of analysis to find some structures. Okay, so you're just building the structures from, from the crash point and, and the data that's around that crash point. Correct. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. Thank you.